Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michelle Easton, president of the Claire Booth Luce Policy Institute, and I want to thank you all for being here today. Uh, welcome to our November Conservative Women's Network Lunch. Special thanks to Bridget Wagner here from the Heritage Foundation. Uh, we've been partners in these lunches now for 15 years. Now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Megan Cox Gordon. Megan is a Wall Street Journal children's book reviewer, and her journal column appears in the paper's reviews section each weekend, and I read it because now I have grandbabies, and I want to know what kind of books to get them. And one thing we passed out, you probably see it on the table outside, is from her website. These are some excellent children's books, uh, recommended books, and I'm using this to buy my grandchildren's Christmas gifts. <laughs> She's also written numerous other critical pieces for the paper, including op-eds and reviews of books by authors such as Salman Rushdie and J.K. Rowling. She's also writing a book on this topic of her uh, talk today about reading aloud to children. She's an essayist, a book critic, a former foreign correspondent. Her work has appeared in so many publications, including the Daily Telegraph, the Washington Post, National Review, and the Weekly Standard, to name just a few. In the 1990s, she lived and worked overseas as a foreign correspondent. Um, she worked for Monitor Radio, Radio the Christian Science uh, Monitor Station, also wrote for the San Francisco um, uh, paper, and she was based in Hong Kong, later in Tokyo, then London. She traveled and reported extensively from Cambodia to Somalia, from China to Israel, from South Korea to Northern Ireland. Recently, she told me she joined the Little Flower Parish Choir in uh, Bethesda, and she also does yoga, that's why she looks so good. And she graduated magna cum laude from Bowdoin College in Maine. She lives just outside of Washington with her husband and their five children, 21 years old, 19 years old, 15 years old, 14 years old, and 10 years old. Please join me in welcoming Megan. Thank you. Uh, I, can I just say that it's far scarier to try and sing in a choir than it is <laughs> to do a lot of other things in life. Um, okay. Once upon a time, there lived a king and a queen who lacked for nothing but a child to love. Theirs was a country with a noble history, and they yearned for sons and daughters to whom they could bequeath the rich culture that they and their people so enjoyed. So it was with jubilation that the kingdom received news that the queen had been safely delivered of a baby girl at last. The next night in a chapel at the castle, the king and queen watched with solemn joy as their daughter was christened. And then they repaired to a small gilded chamber for a celebratory supper with the five fairies they had asked to be godmothers to their child. Good books for children almost always include descriptions of the food, so I will tell you what they ate. <laughs> the royal couple and the fairies sat down to a feast of succulent roast pork with ruby red currant jelly wobbling in a silver bowl and fresh asparagus with sea salt and olive oil, crisp from the oven and slightly caramelized at the tips. <laughs> a refreshing salad of delicate Rapunzel lettuce and they had delicious wines and sparkling waters, and afterwards everyone could have as much as anyone wanted from box boxes of chocolates swathed with violet ribbons. Mm -hmm. And when all were content, the senior fairy put down her jeweled goblet and said, Sisters, let us now give our gifts to the princess. So the fairies rose and approached the cradle, and using her wand, the eldest fairy pointed toward the sleeping child. I, said the fairy, give her elegance with posture as regal as her parentage. Said the second fairy, I give her intelligence so that she will flourish at school and always get straight A's. Mm -hmm. No, 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 she needs an occasional B and even a C, put in the third fairy who thought children should have to struggle a bit for the sake of their characters. Fair enough, said the second fairy. The fourth fairy nodded. I give her language, a lively vocabulary, a command of sentence structure, a feeling for cadence, and a warm sympathy for good writing. Well, this was the best gift yet, and the king and queen were beaming. And finally, it was the turn of fairy number five. I give her a lovely long attention span so that she can gaze upon the beauty of the world and contemplate it, so that she will listen closely when others are speaking, and so that someday, when she is grown, she will be able to fully comprehend the novels of Henry James. 
Well, everyone was feeling pretty happy about the princess and all the nice gifts when suddenly the doors of the chamber burst open. There came a terrible thunderclap, a burst of foul smoke, and out of the foul miasma, the party was horrified to see fairy number six, an uninvited guest reeking with malevolence. She wore a T-shirt with the Nietzsche quotation, <laughs> God is dead. And she held in her hand not a wand, but some sort of sleek inviting device with an apple on it. <laughs> Fools, she said, did you think you could keep me out? I have gifts of my own for this baby. I bring technology and distraction and empty glamour, not just to the child, but to her parents too, and not just to this family, but to the entire kingdom. I give them texting and Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat. I give them Twitter and words with friends and Candy Crush. <laughs> My gifts will squander their time, scatter their thoughts, ruin their posture, seduce them away from one another by means of countless shallow diversions, and ultimately make it impossible for any of them to enjoy long-form writing. And with a triumphant cry and another repulsive puff of smoke, fairy number six disappeared. Well, you can imagine the horror on the faces of the king and the queen and the fairies. All but one, that is. The third fairy the one who thought the princess should not quite get straight A's, had never had a chance to bestow, bestow her present, and now she spoke. I cannot take back the gifts my vengeful sister has given, she said, but there, I can bequeath something that will mitigate their ill effects. I wonder if anyone here can guess what that thing might be. <laughs> I give this child the gift of reading aloud, said the fairy. From this night forward, her parents will spend at least an hour every evening reading to her. For a long time, she will sit on their laps and they will show her board books and with simple words and illustrations and she may not seem to react. After all, she was only born yesterday. But the king and queen will persist and soon the princess will follow pictures and stories with increasing interest. And as she grows, the stories too will grow, becoming longer and more complex. The nightly practice will become precious to this family and will help form the mind and heart of this child. It will also enliven the minds and kindle the hearts of her mother and father, especially if they try to read her any of Oscar Wilde's stories for children, such as the story of the selfish giant, which is impossible for an adult to read aloud without bursting into tears. And yea, the fairy went on, though technology will batter at this family, and the princess will get a smartphone, same as her friends, when she's old enough to take public transportation by herself. <laughs> and there will be Snapchat and Instagram, for that is how it is with teenaged girls. Never will she lose the imprint of these many calm, happy hours of listening to the voices of her parents reading aloud. The king and queen smiled through their tears. Could it be? Was there really a remedy for the awful curse of the sixth fairy? And could it be one so simple? Ladies and gentlemen, it could, and it is. And that is what I'm here to talk to you about this afternoon. So thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor to be here, and I'm, I'm proud of all of you for braving the, you know, the impending terrorist threat, apparently, the making your way to heritage for this. So I'm here to tell you that reading aloud can be one of the central civilizing practices of family life, an incredible source of joy and fun and unit cohesion. In an age of technology, the family that reads aloud together commits a cheerful act of rebellion refusing to atomize and disperse each to his own screen and to his own separate virtual reality. In an age of fragmentation and social change, the family that reads aloud together fortifies itself. The family that reads together puts the riches of literature at the heart of the home by the coziest means possible. It enriches the grammar and vocabulary and imaginations of its members. It furnishes the minds of its children with things they might never acquire elsewhere. It offers teaching moments without number, and builds a shared in-house language of characters and scenes and witticisms. And um, <laughs> there was an, there's an example from my own household which is very dear to my heart. There was a time a couple months ago when I heard one of my daughters insult another by calling her a common low fat barge woman. <laughs> <laughs> she was quoting Mr. Toad from The Wind in the Willows. I couldn't have been happier. <laughs> Spending an hour every night with a pile of beautiful picture books or with a couple of chapters of My Father's Dragon or Winnie the Pooh or The Horse and His Boy or Treasure Island fosters all kinds of good things. Empathy and creativity, the ability to listen closely, an instinct for good grammar, a deep attachment to the family, and a zest for books and for the world. Now, these are all extravagant claims, but they are all true and justified. 
So today I'm going to talk about a little bit about the habit of reading aloud and what it does for children and the grown-ups who love them most. And then I want to get into some of the larger cultural ramifications. So first off, I think it's fair to say that everyone, everyone knows that reading to small children is a good idea, right? I don't think there's any controversy about that. We also know that we all need vitamin D, but that doesn't stop us from developing deficiencies. So too with reading out loud, it's a practice so nourishing and important that we ought now and then to ask, what does vitamin D do again? No, kidding. Um, <laughs> what does reading aloud do again, and is my family getting enough? So last year, for the first time, the American Academy of, Pedi of Pediatrics put reading aloud on its list of recommended practices, starting in infancy, like the, as with the princess in our story. So now 60,000, 60, I'd say I think it's like 62,000 pediatricians have begun recommending that children get a daily allowance of reading aloud, the same way they do with their other nutrients. Uh, scientific research increasingly confirms what everyone here probably already knows instinctively or believes that reading with babies and toddlers is incredibly good for their little brains. As the Academy said in its policy statement, reading regularly with young children stimulates optimal patterns of brain development and strengthens parent-child relationships at a critical time in child development, which in turn builds language, literacy, and social-emotional skills that last a lifetime. Absolutely. Lots of cuddly time spent poring over board books, hearing them read out loud, connecting the words to the pictures, maybe seeking and finding little objects at the parents' prompting. All this fills their tiny heads with what uh, Australian writer and literacy adv advocate Mem Fox calls rhythmic gems. It gives young children, Mem says, a huge store of information to bring to the task of learning to read. A nice fat bank of language, or she'd say it in an Australian accent, I guess. <laughs> nice fat bank of language or something. <laughs> words, phrases, structures, and grammar, the words in their heads then begif begin to drift into their daily speech, and all at once we have an articulate child. <laughs> Excuse me, I would have a Rubio moment here. <laughs> the tenderness of the time together is not to be underestimated either. For an article I wrote this summer on the topic I chatted with the writer Kate DiCamillo, she of Win Dixie, uh, because of Win Dixie and the Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane. Some of you may know those books. And she had a beautiful way of describing it. We let down our guard when someone we love is reading us a story, she told me. We exist together in a little patch of warmth and light. And it's true, we do. I have spent most nights of the last 21 years reading aloud to my children. And first there was one, a daughter. And I read to her, and then came a son, and I brought him along while I was reading to his sister, and pretty soon there came another daughter, and another, and that meant that every night we would read a variety of books. Maybe each child would choose a picture book, and then there'd be a part of a bigger book at the end. People would be draped and piled all over the place. We might have Mike Mulligan and his steam shovel as one child's request, and Sylvester and the magic pebble as someone else's and then maybe make way for ducklings, and then good night moon. Well, I always had to have good night moon. That was pretty much a, day, a nightly thing. And maybe then a chapter of Little House in the Big Woods, and then I'd tuck everyone in and good night. And after a bit, there came a fourth and final daughter, so we added her to the mix. And we'd go through cycles. We'd read all the Little House books, plus a lot of picture books, and um, then through a mess of novels, and then through all the Chronicles of Narnia, and The Hobbit, and The Island of the Blue Dolphins, and The Wolves of Willoughby Chase, and Beowulf, and The Dallaire's Book of Greek Myths, and I don't know what all. Our youngest is now 10, and we're deep into C.S. Lewis, The Silver Chair, again. And it struck me the other day that I might be reading my way through Narnia for the last time, at least for a long time. My first reaction was, oh, sad. And my second was, thank goodness. <laughs> I love these books, don't get me wrong, but I do think I've read all of them aloud pretty much every other year for two decades. <laughs> it's also kind of annoying because um, no one wants me to read The Last Battle anymore. They say it's too sad. It's about reaching heaven, I tell them, and they, don't, they can't stand it. Those awful scenes of Puzzle the donkey being made to wear the lion's skin like a false prophet, and when the dwarves shoot all the horses, that's the scene I can't abide. Anyway, back to the larger point. G.K. Chesterton said that we need, to view, we need to so view the world as to combine an idea of wonder and an idea of welcome. And that is what reading aloud to children does for them. Uh, as they move out of toddlerhood and into proper childhood, that gives them wonder and welcome and a stake in their literary patrimony. That's what we give them when we open a book of Aesop's fables and unfurl the story of the fox and the grapes. 
moral. It is easy to despise what you do not have. It's what we give them when we take them down the Yangtze River with the little duckling Ping, or down the rabbit hole with Alice, or to Africa by way of the just so stories, oh best beloved, in Kipling's strange and memorable telling with those odd inky illustrations. In The Magician's Nephew, another chronicle of Narnia, coming soon to a bedroom near me, <laughs> uh, there is a magical wood. Perhaps you know of it. It's very quiet, very still. In between the trees, there are countless small pools of water. The pools don't look very deep, but each of them, if you jump in, will lead you down into an entirely different reality, a distinct world with its own inhabitants and history and even constellations. In the story, the magical wood is called the wood between the worlds. Uh, to me, there is almost no better metaphor for the moment in a child's bedroom when you have yet to choose the book or books for that night. Picture books may not look particularly deep. Most of them are no more than about 32 pages. Yet each has its own reality, its own inhabitants, and its own means of engaging a child's imagination. Chapter books may be slim paperbacks, and they may have a lot of goofy fun. Astrid Lundgren's Pippi Longstocking books come to mind. Yet they, too, are worlds unto themselves. More complex stories are like more like older worlds with longer histories that resonate in deeper ways and big red suns hanging in their ancient skies. Jumping into each of these pools is a new experience. Sometimes you find the water is too shallow and your feet hit the ground and no one cares very much, and whatever that book was, you don't read it again. But sometimes the reader and the listeners want to submerge themselves again and again. They feel enriched and enlivened and altered by the exposure to a story. Literature itself is full of stories of personal transformation as a direct consequence of hearing stories read aloud. One of my favorites is Tom Canty, the impoverished hero of Mark Twain's The Prince and the Pauper. Don't know if anyone's read that here. Buffeted by drunkenness, riot, and squalor in 16th century London, Tom has the good fortune to come under the clandestine tutelage of an old priest. And when Tom's not begging for pennies, he listens, Twain writes, to good Father Andrew's charming old tales and legends about giants and fairies, dwarves and genii, and enchanted castles and gorgeous kings and princes. His head grew full of these wonderful things, and many a, a night, as he lay in the dark on his scant and offensive straw, tired, hungry, and smarting from a thrashing, he unleashed his imagination and soon forgot his aches and pains in delicious picturings to himself of the charmed life of a petted prince in a regal palace. Twain goes on to explain that Tom begins to read the old priest's books and to ask the man to explain and enlarge upon them. By and by, Twain goes on, Tom's reading and dreaming about princely life wrought such a strong effect on him that he began to act the prince unconsciously. His speech and manners became curiously ceremonious and courtly to the vast admiration and amusement of his intimates. But Tom's influence among these young people began to grow now day by day. And in time, he came to be looked up to by them with a sort of wondering awe as a superior being. He seemed to know so much, and he could do, he could do and say such marvelous things. And withal, he was so deep and wise. Could there be a better ad for reading aloud? <laughs> Pretty soon, if you know the story, even if you haven't read the book, Tom is actually mistaken for a prince and finds himself treated as the pampered scion of Henry VIII. So perhaps that's not so realistic in our world, but Tom's fictional story points to the observable real-life gains that children rich and poor make when adults take the time to read to them. Um, perhaps some of you are familiar with the 1995 study that found the famous word gap. Um, basically, by the age of three, children in wealthier or more educated or more literate families are found, were found to have heard millions, literally millions more words spoken aloud than children from less motivated or poorer households. Evidence of the word gap apparently manifests in children as young as 18 months. And it seems to have a strong bearing on later academic achievement. So in a way, it's surprising that it took the American Academy of Pediatrics so long to put reading aloud on its list of recommended <laughs> practices, but hallelujah that it's happening. Um, this past summer, there's a, some of you may also have been aware of this little kerfuffle that took place. Um, it's a British philosopher named Adam Smith. It's very funny. There was, but <laughs> Adam Swift, <laughs> who got all sorts of really angry email after he gave an interview to the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. He was plugging his new book. And in the interview, he said, and I quote, the evidence shows that the difference between those who get bedtime stories and those who don't, the difference in their life chances 
is bigger than the difference between those who get elite private schooling and those who don't. It is a stunning claim. As it happens, Professor Swift was using the phrase bedtime stories as a kind of shorthand for the overall culture of the family. Um, parenting styles, dinner conversations, all reading at bedtime as well. What made people crazy is that he went on to joke that perhaps those of us who do read to our children at night ought occasionally to consider that we are, as he put it, unfairly disadvantaging other people's children. <laughs> I mean, it was certainly puckish, maybe not the most persuasive way to connect the dots between the way children are raised and their life outcomes. I believe that his interest in the subject came from a wish to analyze how best the state could intervene to equalize the prospect of good outcomes for children. In his book, he writes, the inequalities between children stem from processes more central to, one might say, constitutive of family life than egalitarians might have hoped. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> it's not money that makes a parent read to a child. All a mother or father needs is a book, and those are free from the public library. All that's required is a bit of determination and a bit of time, and the time to read can be any time. Over breakfast, at dinner, at bedtime, while toddlers are in the bath. I myself have read to them in every location um, and in every state. The writer and illustrator Rosemary Wells, uh, who's another wonderful champion of reading aloud, has long argued for just 20 minutes um, or half an hour of reading a day. Personally, I think more is better, but 20 minutes may be all that some families can manage. OK. Rosemary Wells is eloquent about what results. The child who sits in a reader's lap is more privileged than the child who is given fancy computer games, she says. This child can be poor, he can live in the meanest streets of a huge city, or a house trailer in the farthest reaches of the rural hills. But if his father sits and reads quietly to him half an hour a day, this boy is not at risk. He is blessed and will grow up smart and strong. Children whose parents read aloud to them are children whose minds and hearts are getting a special kind of daily maintenance. These children make understanding friends, decent writers, and fun traveling companions. Mm -hmm. Having met all manner of curious personalities in books, they are more likely to tolerate and enjoy eccentricity in the real world, and it is devoutly to be hoped in their parents. Their minds will be more handsomely furnished than others with literary and cultural references and perhaps the rhythms of poetry. Our children, like us, are primates, monkey see, monkey do. When we send humane, thoughtful, well-read children into the world, they encourage those traits in their friends. So reading aloud as a family is not just a private act. It has public effects. And it strengthens the larger culture in other ways. Reading classic literature in particular perpetuates the consciousness of characters and customs and virtues that come from the past, belong in the present, and deserve to travel into the future. To read a book aloud is to bring a story to life. And it is a kind of life, especially if you use voices for each character and really occupy the story as you're reading it. Stories remain alive, as we might say, in the mouths of those who read them and in the minds of those who hear them. When stories are no longer told, they fall from the frame of reference of the world, and they die. So in reading aloud every evening, families are in a serious way keeping faith with the past, putting new roots into it while sending fresh blossoms, as you might say, into the future. That may sound a little obscure, but there are good reasons for us all to be worried about the degree to which children are becoming disconnected from the cultural past, deracinated, untethered, and lost. Technology is stealing huge chunks of childhood. The most recent survey in the US from a nonprofit group called Common Sense Media found that eight to 10-year-olds are spending five and a half hours a day in uh, consuming media. 11 to 14-year-olds are now spending eight hours and 40 minutes a day with older teenagers clocking in, actually it's slightly less, with just under eight hours a day. Thank God for high school homework, I suppose. <laughs> it's just possible that these children are using their time online to read thrilling works of literary fiction, but somehow, I don't think so. According to this year's annual scholastic study of reading patterns, 52% of children do have a children, uh, sorry, excuse me, do have a grown up reading to them when they're little. It drops to 34% by the time kids are between 6 and 8. And by the time they're between 9 and 11, only 17% of children have, something, have someone reading a story to them most nights of the week. Now, as Mark Twain would remind us, there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. So as melancholy as these figures sound, the real picture may be more sanguine. But here's something really sad. From the same study from Scholastic, 
40% of 6 to 11-year-olds whose parents no longer read aloud to them said they wish it was still happening. It's so sad. I mean, not only, not only are no, most children not being read to, so they're not being enriched by books that might stretch them beyond what they can read for themselves, they might also not be getting great books at school. I mean, they might, but they might not. Depends on where they live, how right on their teachers are. When I was in the seventh grade, um, I had moved up to live in very rural Maine with my dad, um, who had gone back to the land. That's another story for another time. And I was enrolled in a four-room elementary school. And uh, the principal was not actually a local Mainer, so his, his, uh, I do not in any way want to impugn Mainers by what I'm about to tell you that he said. But uh, the principal of my school um, was talking about music. And one remark really stuck in my memory. It hit me at the time and stuck with me ever since. He said, I don't like that Mozart crap. <laughs> if you have a school principal like that, there are probably lots of lovely writers you'll never read and swashbuckling adventures you will never go on. Once upon a time, but this isn't a fairy story, this part, parents could send their children off to school and know that they would be making the acquaintance of writers such as Homer and Milton and Shakespeare and Dickens and Austin, Austin and Byron. And we know this is not the case everywhere. Indeed, you can now get an English degree from Georgetown University or from Johns Hopkins or Amherst or Williams or UVA, among others, without having to take a single class devoted to Shakespeare. That the study of English could be conducted without regard to its single most gifted exponent would seem to be from the pages of The Onion. <sighs> it's incredible, but there you are. That is cultural drift of an extraordinary sort. And there are sharper, more violent ways to separate people from the wellsprings of their own societies. And I would like you to bear with me here, because we're going to take a little detour, but it does lead back, I promise. <laughs> this is a very jarring change, I realize, looking at it now. The mass murdering dictators of the last century all launched bloody and extensive campaigns designed explicitly to rip people away from the past, to purge it from the art, the music, and the poetry, from old cultural traditions and religious consolations and ways of dress and even practices of cooking and eating. Lenin and Stalin in the Soviet Union and Mao in China but also North Korea's Kim Il-sung and Pol Pot in Cambodia, they all wanted adults to behave and submit, and they all wanted deracinated children to become the malleable material for the indoctrinating revolutionary state. To this day, in North Korea, children grow up knowing only children's books and children's stories that sell a propagandistic party line, miraculous tales of the wondrous and confected achievements of the tyrannical Kim clan. We have obviously been more fortunate in this country. No tyrant is using violence to try and separate us from our cultural heritage. But there are other actors and other methods. Now is not the moment to go too deeply into the social phenomena of which everyone here will be well aware. Enough to say, right, that the armies of political correctness march ever faster. The discrediting of the thoughts and writing of dead white European males continues apace. Live ones, too. I don't know if anyone ever happened to hear the review on NPR of Jonathan Franzen's new book, um, but the reviewer didn't like it, and she dismissed it um, because he, he writes from a place of white privilege. And heaven help anyone who doesn't get with a social program at exactly the right time to please the mob on Twitter. The postmodern obsession with race, class, and gender continues to produce an apparently inexhaustible supply of grievances about the ways that our culture departs from perfection. Causes of grievance, I mean, this also should be from the onion. So small, they're called microaggressions, as we all know. Don't trigger me. <laughs> if you trigger me, I'm going to have bad feelings, and I can't be expected to have bad feelings. Bad feelings must be prevented, right? How do we stop them? Well, we have to stop them before they begin. If they're microscopic, you have to really go down deep. And the only way to do that is to attack the roots of the problem, which is what? Race, class, and gender. So again, no one is using violence, but we're, well, not yet. Let's hope some loud voices, certainly. But we're seeing the same awful impulse to dig out and expunge and extirpate old ways. They might offend or pollute afresh. The New York Gilbert and Sullivan players recently canceled their production of The Mikado that was um, supposed to run next month. The show is set in feudal Japan, and it mostly makes fun of Englishmen. And the music has very witty lyrics, if you happen to know their music. But the Mikado trades too much now in offensive racial stereotypes. Plus, the company's actors are not Japanese. So to look Japanese on stage, they would have to wear makeup. 
but that's called yellow face, and that's offensive. And next season, as some of you may know, the Metropolitan Opera in New York is mounting a production of Verdi's Otello, uh, but the lead tenor will not wear makeup for this production, um, so as to, you know, to, to make, and make up to darken his complexion so that he looks North African. The character is North African. He's a Moor in an Italian opera set on the island of Cyprus. But on the stage in New York, Othello will have white skin for fear of evoking folk memories of blackface or minstrelry, which are offensive. Now, you may be thinking, hmm, we have strayed an awfully long way from the cozy bedtime ritual of reading at night. But what is happening in the wider world obviously has a direct bearing on what happens in our homes and vice versa. The truth is, almost every year, whole realms are becoming offensive and controversial. Marriage doesn't mean what everyone used to think marriage meant. Men may or may not be men. Women may or may not have been men. In children's books, as in the wider culture, depictions of former ways of being in the world are open to question and possibly dangerous. For a 2005 reissue of Good Night Moon, right, the Ur children's book, the sweetest little book ever, um, the publishers photoshopped out of the, so the illustrator's Clement Hurd, and when he had his um, cover photo taken, or his sort of back cover photo taken originally, he was, I can't quite do this, he was holding a, it's like saying like this with a cigarette. Well, they thought, in 2005, you can't have a cigarette in a picture, in a book for children. So they took it out. So Clement Hood stands there like this. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of funny, right? But it's, but it's creepy, too. I mean, you know. Uh, what about, uh, you know, what about heteronormative books, like Pat the Bunny? How long before that becomes controversial? After all, it depicts a con conventional white family with a daddy who shaves and a mummy who invites the little reader to poke a finger through her ring, and it's probably a wedding ring. What about Little House on the Prairie? How Ma has a poor opinion of Indians and says so. Or how in one scene, Pa and the other men of their South Dakota town appear in blackface and sing and dance in a minstrel <coughs> show. The townspeople in the book are shown to enjoy the spectacle. Should children today even know that such attitudes and events existed in the 19th century? Will they be allowed to know as the years go by and the books are reissued? Or will such scenes that offend modern sensibilities be made to disappear down the memory hole? Ray Bradbury used his 1953 novel, Fahrenheit 451, forgive me, to warn of the danger posed to literature by the ranks of the offended. In an incredible twist, considering that his book is all about censorship and destruction of troublesome books. Bradbury's publisher actually censored certain passages in later editions behind his back. As the 60s and 70s progressed, meanwhile, Bradbury began getting complaints about defects in his novel, such as its male chauvinism. In an acid afterward to the 1979 reissue, Bradbury let fly. He wrote, it is a mad world and it will get madder if we allow the minorities be they dwarf or giant, orangutan or dolphin, nuclear head or water conversationalist, pro-computerologist or neo-Luddite, simpleton or sage, to interfere with aesthetics. He went on, there is more than one way to burn a book, and the world is full of people running about with lit matches. The present is sometimes in great haste to expunge the past, and it is a species of tragedy. Those benighted people in the past made the present possible, after all. A tiny measure of gratitude would seem to be in order. The nightly reading aloud in this context is an act of generational fealty. In a very real way, it becomes a means of cultural con conservation, of preservation, and of resistance. Scheherazade and Robin Hood and Aravis and Shasta and Ma and Pa and Laura remain alive as long as we keep telling their stories. Some of them may fall out of fashion, for crimes we do not yet realize that they committed. And their stories may disappear from future schools and libraries and bookstores, but we can keep them alive in our homes. A friend of mine, Maureen Ferguson, I don't know if anyone here knows her, Mike Ferguson's wife, recently drew my attention to an amazing validation of what reading aloud can do to kindle an independent spirit in a place of conformity. Um, I hope I don't mangle his name. Um, the blind Chinese human rights activist Chen Guancheng uh, in his book, The Barefoot Lawyer, describes how he didn't learn to read using Braille until he was 18. Um, as a disabled child in rural China, he wasn't allowed to go to school, so the only education he had as a boy was listening to his father read aloud. 
And his father read to him the stories of the great dynasties, uh, how they treated the people, how they, and how the dynasties fell. And it was from these stories that Chen got his song, passionate feeling about justice with regards to oppressive governments. Being excluded from school had the ironic benefit for him of sparing him communist indoctrination. It was his father's faithful reading that gave him the education that would launch him on a human rights campaign. So for children, whether a blind boy in the Chinese countryside or a lively fifth grader in the Maryland suburbs, the really great thing about hearing stories at home uh, is that it's not school, where you have to focus and concentrate and remember and maybe take notes. There's no hint of cod liver oil. For us grown-ups, reading aloud can be a kind of reclamation, a regrounding. We can enjoy the stories, too. And if we're inclined to use goofy voices, as some of us, I'm afraid, are inclined to do, well, that just adds to the fun. <laughs> But when you're a child listening to your parents tell you stories, which is what it's like, right, listening to someone read aloud, you're not thinking, ah, oh, yes, I am the recipient of a radical act of cultural transference. <laughs> you're thinking about the story, right? You're in the story. What's happening now and what's going to happen next? Which reminds me, we never did finish our story, did we? Let me see, where were we? Ah, oh, yes, the clever third fairy had just given her gift to the infant princess, here we are. Was there really a remedy for the awful curse of the sixth fairy? And could it be one so simple? At this point, one of my children would have said, I mean, we already read that part. <laughs> it could. And so it came to pass as the third fairy foretold. The princess grew up smart and strong and got mostly A's with a smattering of B's and C's. Some years later, she married the, ki the prince of a neighboring kingdom, and as their children came into the world, great was the pleasure she took in carrying on the tradition of reading to them. The king and queen were exemplary grandparents, and they too read to the tots whenever they could. Mm -hmm. It is true that reading aloud did not happen every single night exactly. Sometimes a pageant or a council meeting would go late, and it was 11 before the children were in bed, and plus it was a school night. And there were nights when the parents had been making merry over much, and kept the whole ordeal to a couple of picture books. And <laughs> I'm sorry to say that once or twice a voice was heard to say, the movie was your story tonight. <laughs> but on the whole, fine things happened in the imperial households as a result of the third fairy's gift. Following the example of their sovereigns, the mothers and fathers of both kingdoms adopted the practice of reading aloud in their own homes. The common people logged off email, put their phones on vibrate, and snuggled up by the fire after supper to read Bread and Jam for Francis and Curious George and The Secret Garden and The Wizard of Oz and dozens and dozens of other wonderful stories to their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And do you know what? They all lived happily ever after. <laughs> I'm willing to bet that every single person in here who knows a youngster is going to read to them more after I hearing hope so. that. that, is, that would be, <laughs> I would like to. I would like everyone to read to everyone. I think there is. I'm not actually looking into this now. Something is something special happens in the human brain when someone tells us a story, which is again what reading aloud really is. Mm -hmm. It's different. Uh, I just read the other day, for instance, that babies, um, babies are very receptive to a second language when it's spoken to them by a human being. You can give a baby a little kind of, you can show them videos, you can show them kind of, you know, some sort of screen-based language learning. It, they don't pick up on it so much. But a human being looking at them and talking to them, they pick it up. And their little brains light up. So there's, there's something really important going We've on. We've noticed in our family, people that marry in, how do you say, yeah. who perhaps were from families where there wasn't reading, when we read to the kids, they all gather around, yes. grown-up people. Oh, yes. <laughs> because they're just hungry to hear some stories, because not all families do it. No, I think that's right. Yeah. I think there is there's a kind of like an, a, it's like you can live without a, a good yes. vitamin D, right? But yes. you thrive if you have enough vitamin Absolutely. D. And there is a kind of hungry, yes. hungry feeling that we almost don't even acknowledge right. that can be fed by listening right. to stories. Right. I mean, I think it's wonderful, for instance, that there, there has been a sort of resurgence of storytelling in a very low way in the country. Perhaps you've heard on the radio, the Moth Radio Hour, there's live storytelling that takes place now. And it's, um, it, it speaks to something deeply human. And of course, that is how stories, of course, were originally transmitted right. before we had the written word. Right, right. We have a couple of microphones, I think. Do we have microphones? Um, and if you have a question, if you would raise your hand, I'll let you call on people. Sure. If you would give your name and your affiliation. You don't have to have questions, though. <laughs> oh, wait. Don't, no. I need some. 
mine isn't a question, but yesterday uh, I shared with our uh, Bible study that because we are going to be studying Pilgrim's Progress next uh, in January. And I shared with them that when my children were little, I could threaten them when I wouldn't read them uh, Pilgrim's Progress at night. Isn't that fantastic? And so fast forward to this spring when my daughter had her birthday, and she's over 50, and she said, Mom, you know what I just want? One thing. I want Pilgrim's Progress in the old English. Wow. So you just don't know. You know, and it's, it, it's really important. I can't tell you how important it is. Yeah. And, I, and children respond so. I was a nanny. I don't mean to go on, but I no, was please. a nanny. Because I was writing a screenplay, I had to do something. And uh, the, the children, this is what they, they want. They go immediately to the books. Yeah. When you have inculcated a, a pattern of doing that, regardless. That's what they want. Yeah. And the same in Sunday school, when I've had three years minding the three-year-olds, and they get ratty, <laughs> and I just say, do you want a story? Yeah. And every one of them goes over and picks a book up, yeah. and they come running back. Yeah, it's, it's like magic, isn't it? It's magic, and, and more than everything that you say, is this tape, Michelle? Yes. Uh, did yeah. you tape her speech? Yes, we did. Good, I need it. <laughs> <laughs> it was wonderful. Thank, oh, you, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry I looked down so much. I, I, I made the mistake years ago. I was invited to give a, um, to talk actually about some of my adventures in, uh, in, in the wider world. And I thought, oh, I could talk for hours about that. So I, I, I think I may have had two note cards with like three or four bullet points on them. I see. You're wincing. Do you have this experience, too? Um, and I got up, and I probably had 40 minutes or something to talk. And, man, I was through with those bullet points in five minutes. And then I, and there was this audience. And so ever since that day, I swore, you know, I will never not have a script again. <laughs> can, I, can I ask, um, who else had, I, I just thought that the talk was beautiful. Thank I mean, you. Just, it, in itself, it was a, a work of art. Um, who else have you delivered this talk to? And how available are you to give talks? If we, and we all probably have women's groups or church groups or homeschool groups or... Well, I love money. <laughs> 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 I've, no, I've, this is, I've, this, I've only delivered this once before, and I am indeed working on a book, so I really hope... I hope you'll invite me back when yes. I have a stack of books to sell. Oh, yes. But um, uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, I would. I, I, I actually, I really feel an evangelist on this topic. I, I wrote a piece for the paper, for the journal this past summer about it. And one of the things that made me realize that people are hungry for it is just it, it had an unbelievably positive, powerful reaction, just thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people, which is really very gratifying. And, you know, I've written a few things here and there that have made people very upset, and that gets a big reaction, too. And I find I don't, I'm not really constituted for that kind of warfare. Um, I prefer now to not um, be attacked on social media as much as possible. In fact, I will tell you that there was a piece I wrote about four years ago about young adult literature that got such a powerful reaction that the hatred of me was, I was number two trending topic on Twitter. And the <laughs> only person who beat me out was, what's his last name? Uh, oh, gosh, I'm blanking on it, but um, the fellow who, uh, Anthony Weiner, who. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. so so he, yeah, he, he texted out his private parts, <laughs> and I wrote an article. So it was like neck and neck, like who is more controversial? <laughs> but anyway, no, but on, and, and I'll say one other thing about, about reading aloud that I think is really kind of important for us as a culture, and it's something I want to develop out in, in other contexts, and that is that this is not a partisan issue. Uh, children are precious, and they have these little minds that they deserve, every child deserves to have this kind of thing. It's, it's free. All it takes is some grown-up to take the time. And, and if you scratch the surface of almost anyone, actually there are two things you will find. One is that almost everybody studied piano and wished they didn't give it up. <laughs> <laughs> and the other is that almost everybody either has stories of, of either reading, being read aloud to and loving it or wishing they had and doing it, wanting to do it with their own children. It's just an amazing, again, speaking to this this unfed hunger and this that is that is a, a real thing 
And so I really do want to evangelize uh, this, the beauty of this. It's just, you know, there aren't that many things in life when you're doing them, you think this is entirely worthwhile, right? You know, right. maybe hitting a tennis ball really hard is entirely worthwhile. <laughs> We've got a question yeah. here. Yeah, so it was interesting that you mentioned the piece that you wrote about the uh, young adult literature because that's actually why I came. I had stumbled upon that and was very impressed and glad that you, you wrote that. I'm wondering, will your book uh, address that issue at all? No, um, I'm, I'm, I have to say I'm kind of fried on that mm. issue. It's, I, well, I'm being taped, so I shouldn't make any extravagant claims. But I almost... I almost feel like there was an edging off from some of that stuff after, you know, in the, in, the, in the two or three years after the piece. I mean, my disquiet about the darkness in young adult literature is actually shared by people in the industry, but it's very difficult to push back a cult against a culture, right? Nobody here, of course, knows that, but, you know, it's very hard. And, um, and there, is a, there, is, there is a right on group think that is really um, painful. Um, so I don't know, but uh, so no, I won't be writing about that. No, I'm, I'm interested in reading aloud, actually. I'm interested also in, uh, in how, what, what is happening in our brains when it's happening, when we're delivering. There's, you know, just again, this is, v I'm very early in the stage of this, but uh, I saw that uh, there are some researchers in Japan who are working with the elderly and trying to work out ways of stimulating the elderly. When they read aloud and listen to books read aloud, their brains light up. I mean, it's really quite, Something is happening. So, um, so I won't. I did think about that, but it just made me so gloomy. I didn't want it. Also, I hated being a hate figure. I have to tell you, I really, I don't have the skin for it. One more down here. Hi, um, see, I'm Sierra Martin. I'm actually an intern here at Heritage. Um, and I think it's interesting that my current generation, um, I know a lot of kids in high school who their reading levels is so low and it takes them so long to read just major books and it discourages them and I think that that's um, going to just gonna continue being an issue because technology is becoming so much easier yeah. to use and get away with it yeah. um, and another little thing that I think is important not just the parents reading to the child but um, I actually kind of raised my sister a little bit and so I yeah. used to lay in bed with her and read Perfect. her books yeah and the bond that we share now is so much mm -hmm. stronger than I think. And I think today, siblings don't have as great relationships. It's, it's easier yeah. to be so disconnected. Yeah. But I think the act of having one sibling lead to another one yeah. is That's exactly so right. And that's how the large, a lot of larger families do it. They kind yeah. of, you know, there's a parceling right. so there's out. There's a difference. That it's not just the parents reading to the children, but there's well, an effect of that. No, that's a really good point. And, um, and that's what I was, trying, I was trying to get at in this talk about, about that it, that, you know, I mean, technology has made many wonderful things possible. I came here by the miracle of Uber, which, you know, I summoned from my little handheld device. I mean, it's a miracle. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but it does seduce people away from each other, right? I mean, you watch people at restaurants, especially your generation. Everyone's in their own thing. And, and there is, I don't have the uh, numbers at my fingertips, but, um, the vocabulary of American people, the American people, but also particularly younger generations, is measurably dwindling. People are, people are becoming, it's like flowers for Algernon, if anyone ever read that story. Like, as a culture, we're losing our language. And uh, so again, this is something I want to speak to in this other enterprise, is, is, is to find ways to repair that. I mean, it's a tragedy, but you can imagine that someday, you know, reading Jane Austen will be like trying to read Pilgrim's Progress in Middle English or something, you know? Um, how can you, when you have been scrolling around on your iPad all day, which is what you get at high school now, right? I mean, a lot of high schools do that. Both my daughters who are in high school have iPads, and that's how they work now. Um, when you've been doing that, how do, you, how do you open a kind of, you know, great text? I mean, eventually it's going to habituate you not to, I think. That's speculation. Maybe last question here, uh, unless uh, you have more. Yeah. Today's children seem to be <clears throat> very PC themselves at a, at a young age. And if you're reading any one of the older books and they come across any type of wording that they don't think is appropriate, they, 
they call their parents out on things. Oh, you mean from school? Well, no, I mean in the car, you see somebody smoking or whatever. Oh, yeah, Kids yeah, will yeah. call oh, out, you know, somebody who's doing something that they shouldn't be doing. So if you're reading and they call you out on something that's in the book, mm -hmm. uh, how would you handle that? I By think just saying, this is history, you just need to know it if it's... Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. And I think, personally, that is my preferred solution to a lot of the speech correctness. Uh, again, we need more speech, right? We need just, you need, and you need to put things in context. And I do think that, for instance, the scene where Pa and the townsmen are in blackface, I mean, that's now has suddenly been ratcheted up to be horrifically controversial. A year ago, it wasn't. Two years ago, it wasn't. I mean, the entire entire contents of books are, are, might, when we when we look at all of them through these you know ever refined lenses, may become impossible. And the reading aloud context at home is the ideal place, I think, to explain to children. Um, you know, that the people at different times in history thought differently, and people in different parts of the world think differently. And you can give them examples from contemporary life. And that's again, I, I mentioned teaching moments. For me, I think that's a really important part of reading to them. And also sometimes you know there, you'll come across things that are political in children's books. Um, the, um, after, during the Cold War, actually, there were writers who uh, couldn't get published in the adult business because they were active communists, and they went into children's books. So there is, you know, Crockett Johnson, for instance, who wrote Harold and the Purple Crayon, um, which is a book that could be understood various ways, but you could look at it as a child being his own god, making his own reality, uh, remaking the world. That would be one way of looking at it. And he was a member of the Communist Party. And um, and worked for the you know communist and socialist publications. Not that there's anything wrong with that for the taped people, but <laughs> but it's just it's something you know something to know. And and so there is you know it, it's not entirely an accident that uh, children's books have become a bit of a battleground for these ideas. And so you can you know I sometimes will call things out for my children, and not in a kind of you know I don't know not in a I mean just just in a sort of contextual way, just in the same way that you might. Uh, Oh, if someone, well, this is this came up in our household lately. You know, one uh, daughter has been asked to do a, to write a paper about uh, the role of uh, women's constrained social roles in the world of Jane Austen. And I said, well, okay, that's a good, that's a good question. But let's also ask, like, what about men's constrained roles in the age of Jane Austen? Were they free to pursue anything they wanted to pursue? Was, and she thought, oh, I never thought of that. It's like, yeah, that's right. Or Japanese society. When we used to live in Japan, or at least to live and work and, and report in Japan, um, I was asked several times by different uh, outlets that I worked for, you know, to do something about pertaining to the plight of Japanese women. And, you know, you don't have to live there very long to see that there's a context which I, in which everyone is held in a particular relation to everyone else. And, and the, the freedom that we see women being denied in a certain circumstance is actually also denied to men. There are let us say, a limited number of roles that are culturally appropriate, and that's true for everybody. So, I mean, I'm getting way off the point, but um, I feel that it's a kind of related thing. And uh, so I, I do relish those opportunities to uh, point things out when I'm with my children. tell her about the Regnery book. I see Patricia Jackson here, called Happily Ever After. I don't know if you know. It's Elizabeth no, Cantor. And it's about oh, yes, yes, that, okay, well, yes, I do know that book. those women yes. in those novels were so strong, and yeah. so many of their attitudes put in today's world yes. would be so productive. Yes. <laughs> it's a great book. I'll it is. I know, it I'm aware of it. Yeah. There. Well, great. what a wonderful talk. What a wonderful presentation. Thank you. We have a couple gifts for you, but oh, thank great. you so much. <laughs> uh, we have our limited edition Claire Booth Loose Policy Institute coffee mug, and this goes for your writing about young adult books. What's it, what does it say? No good deed goes unpunished. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have a Institute tote bag Excellent. for you. Excellent. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. From the Heritage, we have a brand new lady scarf. Oh, wow. Ooh. Yes. Battle you of the seen, cool I know. Stuff. <laughs> you guys have seen the men's ties for years and years and years, but we actually now have a lady scarf. Oh, thank you so nice. much. That's You're really great. Our first recipient. Oh, so wonderful. thank you all for joining us. We're going to have you. lunch across the lobby in the Van Andel Center, and we invite you to continue the conversation uh, with Megan. Great. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks for your time. Thank you.